Anybody who has been in one for more than a week can tell you that relationships are mysterious things. There are few things in all of creation with the same ability as relationships to provide us with both exquisite joy and excruciating pain, sometimes even simultaneously. God made us in such a way that relationships really are uh, essential to our survival, and yet we find them sometimes so incredibly complex. Wouldn't be too much to say, I don't think, that in some ways we are held captive to the state of our relationships. When our relationships are good, we're good. And when they're bad, we're not so good. And it amazes me that not even Jesus, the Son of God, the the very one who gave us the capacity for relationship, not even Jesus was exempt from this double-edged nature of relationship both the joy and the agony. Even the Son of God submitted himself to the mystery of relationship. As we've been moving through this Lenten season, I've been thinking a lot about that word, and it occurs to me that the gospel is all about relationship. If, If you boil it down, when you get to the very bottom... It's about God's desire to be in a relationship with you and with me and to go to any length necessary in order for that to happen. I read through the Gospels during this Lenten season and I did so in a way that I never have before. I did so with an eye toward this whole notion of relationship. And for the first time ever, I noticed a definite arc, if you will, a a definite trajectory of the relationship between Jesus and those that we typically think of as his best friends, the 12 disciples. Their relationship started out like many relationships do. Really, it, it began because of curiosity. Up in Galilee, This new prophet by the name of Jesus was making a name for himself. And his cousin, John the Baptist, had come out of the wilderness to make all sorts of claims about him. And in a little town like Galilee, where really there probably wasn't much going on at all, everybody was eager to see a novelty. So the crowds came out to listen to him and to see him. And among those was a fellow by the name of Andrew. And Andrew was so intrigued that he went and he found his brother Peter... They went back and told others, and on and on, until soon there is a a clutch of 12 men who've gathered around this man called Jesus. And I have to think that it was curiosity that kept them in Jesus' relational orbit at first. I mean, after all, he had absolutely nothing to offer them, no money, no power, no prestige, no influence, nothing. And so for a time, I imagine they stayed with him, really, just to see maybe what was going to happen next. And after a time, that curiosity began to transform into amazement as they began to witness things, incredible things, that had never been done before, certainly that they had never seen. This man, Jesus, takes a few pieces of fish, a few pieces of bread, and feeds thousands. He's capable of healing the worst known diseases, leprosy, blindness, paralysis. He can cast out demons. He can walk on water. He even raises people from the dead. Now, if that's not going to amaze you, I don't know what would. That curiosity changed to amazement in their growing relationship with this man, but it didn't take long, not too long, before the amazement itself changed to appreciation. The disciples quickly learned that this was no magician. This was no charlatan who had an amazing bag of tricks. No, this was a man unlike any they had ever met. He genuinely loved 
He truly loved people, especially the people that society had rejected. He seemed to have a radar for those kind of people and sought them out with compassion and mercy and great love. Appreciation filled their hearts as they could see this Jesus is special. We've never met anyone like him. And the relationship between Jesus and the disciples reached its peak when one day, out of the blue, Jesus turned to them and said, So, we've been journeying together for a while now, and you've been listening to what others have to say. Who do the people say that I am? Well, some say that you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead, and others say that you're Elijah, and still others say that you're Jeremiah. Who do you say that I am? Jesus is seeking to define the relationship. Who do you say that I am? And Peter, in a moment of inspiration, though I am sure in some small way, was speaking for the rest of them, said, You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are our Savior. You are the one that we have been looking for. And Jesus said, yes, you're right. You're exactly right. That's who I am. And I have to think that once Jesus affirmed Peter's declaration, there was a sense of exultation among the disciples, a sense of, yes, we are on the winning side now. We've been under the boot of Rome We've been under the boot of the Greeks. We've been under the boot of the Persians, on and on and on. But finally, the Messiah is here, and we are in his circle. Life is going to be good for us. But not too long thereafter, Jesus began to say the strangest things. Things like, you know, guys... One day, not too long from now, I'm going to be taken captive. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to suffer. I'm even going to die. What? I mean, just a few days ago, you were telling us you're the man. Now you're telling us you're going to die? Peter, again, in boldness, speaks up. No, 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 wait, wait, Lord. No, that, this is not going to happen to you. Trust me. This isn't the fate of the Messiah to which Jesus turns and responds and says, get behind me, Satan. You care nothing about the work of God. You care only about the work of man. Get behind me. Can you imagine what the shoulder-to-shoulder conversations must have been like as they walked away from that? What in the world was that all about? Never heard him say anything like that before. It probably would have been better if Jesus had just let things go right there, but he didn't. He persisted in talking about his own death. He kept bringing it up again and again and again, much to the consternation of the disciples. He even told them that it would happen in Jerusalem, and instead of going in the opposite direction, he set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem. I'm sure they were wondering What has happened to our Jesus? I think I like the old Jesus better. What in the world is he talking about? All of this suffering and dying. And then to really throw a curveball. Jesus not only told them that he was going to suffer and die, but then he went so far as to say, and three days later, I will rise from the dead. Okay, Lord. (laughs) The scriptures say that they were so confused and so anxious by all that Jesus had been saying that they were afraid to ask him, what do you mean? Have you ever been in one of those situations where it was just so out there, you, you don't even know where to begin to ask the questions? That's where these guys were. This Jesus that some time back had affirmed he was the Messiah, now 
It's no longer a relationship of confidence. It has fallen into confusion, and it has gone worse from confusion. It has gone into anxiety and even into fear. And it bottoms out during Passover. They gather together as Jesus said they would. And I'm sure there was some sense of anticipation, some sense of, okay, we're getting back to some normalcy now. We, we do Passover all the time. Surely this is just going to be one of our, our good times together. But that was not to be. Because Jesus on that night did what up until that point was the most shocking thing of all. Jesus committed an incredible social faux pas. Let me read it to you from John 13. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, 2,000 years later, 21st century America, we cannot begin to grasp the enormity of this faux pas. The disciples would have been intensely uncomfortable with this development because they lived in a hierarchical relationship. The master did not serve the servant. The servant always served the master. And yet here is our master doing something that is just unheard of. You're going to wash our feet? Are you kidding me? There was a lot of squirming that night and a lot of discomfort. And then when they thought it could not get any worse, Jesus drops this bomb on them. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this... Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. In other words, Jesus is saying, you know that awkward, uncomfortable thing that I just did for you, that you would never dream of doing yourself? Go and do likewise. If you're going to be associated with me, if you're going to be identified with me, if you're going to be my disciple, go and wash feet. I am convinced that it was at that moment, right then, that the disciples came to a fork in the road in their relationship with Jesus. They had gone from the heights down to the confusing, anxious, fearful depths, and now Jesus was calling upon them to do something so base as wash other people's feet. This is what it means to follow the Messiah That was the moment when in their hearts, if not out loud, they began to step back and say, you know what? Uh, It was fun at one time, but it's just weird now. I'm out. How do we know that they were out from that moment forward? Well, just a, a little bit later, they would go with Jesus into the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, we are told that Jesus was in the worst emotional agony of his life. He's crying. He's calling out to his Father. He is praying with such intensity that drops of blood are coming from his forehead. And what are his best friends doing? They're taking a nap. 
That's not what best friends do. Imagine if you were with the person on earth that you consider to be your closest friend and they were pouring their heart out to God and it was evident that they were in tremendous pain. Would you think this is a good time for 40 winks? No, that would never occur to you. And the only reason it occurred to them is because they were beginning to distance themselves from Jesus. They didn't like where this thing was going. And of course, just a little bit later, when the Roman soldiers turned up and it became apparent that, oh boy, this is really going south, not a single one stayed. They all ran. The relationship was broken. And the breaking started earlier that night when Jesus said, a new command I give you. Not an option, not a suggestion. I am commanding you. Love other people as I have loved you. As I looked at that arc of relationship between Jesus and the disciples, it occurred to me how closely it parallels our relationship with Jesus. We, too, come to Jesus initially out of curiosity. Our parents, a Sunday school teacher, a pastor, a coach, a teacher, somebody tells us about Jesus, and our curiosity is piqued, and so we begin to look into it. And before long, we're amazed by what we see, the stories that we read, the testimonies that we hear of what Jesus is doing in people's lives. We're drawn to Him in amazement. Soon enough, we begin to appreciate Jesus. We see that he really is unlike anyone who ever lived, and our hearts begin to fall for him, and soon the day comes that we place our confidence in him. We give him our allegiance. You are the Christ. You are my Christ. You are my Messiah. But if we journey with Jesus much longer, he begins to say to us also words about dying and suffering and taking up a cross. And we don't exactly understand what that means. Uh, Sure, we're all going to die one day, but probably not going to take up a cross. I'm pretty sure of that. Nevertheless, it's a bit confusing. And then comes that moment that we find ourselves with Jesus. And he says to us, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. And we find ourselves at a fork in the road. What are we going to do? What are we going to do when we come home from work one day and it's been a terrible day and we're stressed and we're tired and maybe even a little bit angry and there are diapers to be changed and there is homework that needs to be done? What are we going to do when we get into a little spat with our spouse And even though we have been the ones to step up for the last 50 times to say that we are sorry first, Jesus stands before us and says, I want you to do it again. What are we going to do? What are we going to do when we finally manage to squirrel away enough resources to, to get that new outfit, to get that new toy? And the Lord reminds us there are children in Honduras that need a sponsor, that need something to eat. And you've got a closet full of outfits and a garage full of toys. What are we going to do when Pastor Dan stands up one Sunday and says, we need mentors in our Title I schools. We need you to give up an hour a week to love a child. We need you even to go on a mission trip of all things. What are we going to do? 
You see, it's the little things in life that shape our character and ultimately determine the future of our relationship with Jesus. Will we hear the command and obey? Or like the disciples, will we decide, you know what? It doesn't seem so fun anymore. Tonight we've received the command anew. And a fresh opportunity is before us to hear it and to receive it and to say yes. I will love as you have loved even if that love takes me to a cross. Thanks be to God, there was never hesitation on Jesus' part when it came to loving you and me. He demonstrated a love so great that he allowed his body to be broken, to restore our relationship with God. He loved us so much that he allowed his blood to be spilled that we might be cleansed of our sin, forgiven, in order to restore our relationship with God. As you come to the table tonight, I want to encourage you to come ready to meet Jesus, ready to hear the command once again, And through these means of grace, receive from him the ability to say, yes, yes, I will obey. At Faith Bridge, we have what we call an open table. That is to say, anyone is welcome to come. Anyone who has a relationship with Jesus or would like to have a relationship with him is welcome to come. You'll find stations down here at the front. The bread is gluten-free. Simply take a piece, dip it in the cup, and partake. You're welcome to stay and pray. You're encouraged to stay and pray this evening. We have prayer partners in red shirts if you should have need of one of those. In just a moment, I'm going to pray over the elements. And once... I finish the prayer, our ushers will be in place and they will guide you to the front. Join me in prayer, please. Lord Jesus, thank you for tonight and the opportunity that we have once more to hear your voice, to hear your command as clear as it can be Love one another, just as I have loved you, even if it means humbling yourself, abasing yourself. Love one another as I have loved you. Lord, we want the world to know that you are our Lord, that we are your disciples Give us grace to show it through our actions, not only through our words. Give us grace to be the people that you are commanding us to be. We confess to you that our flesh fights against it, that above all we want to preserve ourselves. But tonight we surrender. We gladly surrender. And we say yes. Thank you for your great love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As the ushers lead you, would you please come forward?